Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Brad Beebe. I'm the product manager for Amazon Neptune. And it's really exciting to see the room almost full. Uh, I saw when I checked today that we had some overflow rooms as well, so excited to see the amount of interest in sort of understanding how you can use a graph to build applications and when you might want to use a graph database. Um, today, we're going to talk about that. I also am joined uh, by two of my colleagues here, uh, Anton Fajardo, who's with uh, PwC, uh, and Kareen Coder, who's with the Tom Sawyer software. So we'll understand a little bit about Neptune and then talk about how PwC is looking at building graph applications and then end up with some examples overall about Neptune. But before we get too far into it, I just wanted to understand a little bit about your own experiences. Can you uh, raise your hand if you guys, if you're in the audience and you're using a graph database currently? OK, so a few. Uh, of those, uh, how many are using uh, Property Graph or Apache Tinkerpop Gremlin? OK, cool. And uh, RDF Sparkle? Great. So fantastic. So we have some, some experts and some, some folks to learn new. So sort of overview. There's a couple of, if you're interested, there are a few other related breakouts that you might want to check out. Um, for more details on performance tuning, we have DAT360. Uh, tomorrow, uh, we also have some examples about getting started with Amazon Neptune and using SageMaker notebooks uh, with your graph database. And then if you're interested in how you can use serverless with graph databases, there's also a session for that. In addition, uh, Tom Sawyer is presenting some sessions about how you can build fraud detection applications uh, with Neptune. So those are some things you may want to check out. And then also, how can you use various different AWS AI services and graph databases? So how can they interact? But you know, the real question that we wanted to start with is, when do you know that you might want to use a graph database? And the answer is, you know, really, conceptually, it's relatively simple. Graphs are really about connections and relationships. And if your application is primarily about traversing those relationships or finding patterns in those relationships, then a graph database may be a really good fit to do that. We often think about this data as what we, we call rich and highly connected. And so that means that it's produced by many different sources and sensors. It's heterogeneous in terms of its schema and data types. And so um, you often have many different types of data that you need to relate. But the thing that really cuts across all of the different applications is that the core value that you get in building these kinds of applications really comes from the relationships. So graphs and graph applications are really about the relationships. When we launched Neptune in May of this year, and of course we announced the preview of Neptune at this conference last, a year ago, we expected customers to build social networking applications to try and understand how people interacted in the relationships that they had and we expected customers to build recommendation engines as well as do fraud applications. These are important uh, graph use cases. But an interesting thing happens when you build a purpose-built database solution that's designed in particular for graph processing. You start to see customers do lots of interesting things with it, things that you didn't necessarily expect. When you give people a highly specialized and high-performance tool, they innovate and they do things with it. So we do have customers in production with social networking applications. Uh, there's a session tomorrow morning talking about how Nike is migrating their core social platform to Amazon Neptune. And we have customers that are building recommendation engines and prosecuting fraud use cases. But we also have customers that are building knowledge graphs. And we have customers that are using graph data models to try and connect parts of their organizations or parts of their data sets that haven't previously been connected. And we see this also in life sciences. We see this in IT and network operations. So the potential space of applications for graphs and graph databases is very, very broad. 
Let's look at a couple of quick examples about the kinds of techniques that you can use. So suppose you wanted to look at product or social recommendation. If you look on your right-hand side, you can see a very simple social network. We have Bill, who knows Alice and Bob. And, but we also have some other information. We have some other data. So we have some purchase history. So we can see these particular pro products that were purchased. And we further have some shared interest. So we can see different individuals, what they liked. And by using a technique that's called triadic closure, a uh, triangle is the smallest fully connected subgraph in a graph, and trying to identify new edges or new relationships that can create these triangles, we can make a very basic recommendation. You might want to purchase this product because people who are also interested in sports purchase this product. And if you look on the right-hand side, you can see there's a friend relationship where one individual knows two people, but those individuals themselves are not yet connected by a friendship relationship. So you can use the same kind of technique. Now, these are obviously oversimplified, but it's the core of how you would, can get started building these kinds of applications. Sometimes you want to help people find things. And knowledge graphs are a technique where you can use graph models to represent domain information and help people find things, help people answer more sophisticated or more complex questions. So here we start with a model of a very famous uh, piece of art, the Mona Lisa, a very famous artist, Leonardo da Vinci, where it's located. And this example, by the way, is taken from the World Wide Web Consortium or the W3C's sort of knowledge graph primer. But we also have some other data sets that we want to use to help people find things. And so we have some social information, so we can see who's interested in this piece of art. We can see some relationships there. We also have some biographical information. We have some geographic reference information, and we have some travel history. We can see where Alice traveled. We can understand that the Eiffel Tower is located in Paris, and the Louvre is also located in Paris. And by starting to think about these things from a graph perspective and through the relationships, we can now start to answer more sophisticated and complex questions. So we can say, who painted the Mona Lisa? Or what museum should Alice visit while in Paris? Or what other artists have paintings in the Louvre? So hopefully you've seen that graphs can be a really powerful tool. So why is this really hard? Why, why aren't graphs more pervasive today? And there's a couple of different challenges. The kinds of database tools that you typically use for other kinds of problems, relational databases in general, tend to not scale efficiently for graph problems. Uh, graph queries have a large number of self-join operations. Those kind of I.O. workloads are different than what relational databases are. So many customers have tried a graph database, or they've done a POC, and it's been really very successful. But when they've tried to put it into production, they haven't been able to maintain the query performance at larger data scales. In addition, lots of different graph alternatives are very challenging to operate. And so you spend a lot of time, because as your data scale increases, trying to build indices, trying to tune JVM parameters. So there's a really a high ops burden, a high ops workload. And this is really the context that we were trying to take with Neptune. And so we built Neptune to be a fully managed graph database feature with service with enterprise features that's really designed for graph workloads that need to have very high throughput graph query answering with low latency. And to give you a quick sense of you know, how we think about that, we really think about graph operations in sort of two major classes. The first are OLTP-style graph reads, which we define as parameterized lookups or parameterized graph queries of less than three hops. 
And for these, the Neptune performance targets are to support up to 10,000 OLTP queries per server per second, with horizontal read scaling with support for up to 15 different read replicas. And then the second class of queries that we think about are more OLAP style queries. And we define these as parameterized graph traversals of three or more hops, onbound graph patterns, combinations of those with complex filters. And for these kinds of OLAP queries, our target is to support up to 100 per server per second with the same kind of horizontal read scaling, but with latencies that are going to vary. And the latencies will vary from hundreds of milliseconds to minutes or more because the ability to effectively evaluate a graph query very much depends on the shape of the data that you have underneath and how much information you have to touch with it. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Anton, and he's going to talk more about how PwC is solving graph problems. Hello. Uh, Anton Pardo. I'm a director of strategic technologies uh, at PwC. Uh, we've definitely seen uh, graph database picking up uh, significantly in the market for the past year, and obviously Amazon is a big part of that. Um, one of the things that Alan Morrison, one of our fellow researchers, uh, always tells me is that from his research, uh, about 80% of the time our data scientists is actually spent on manipulating data sets for delivering business value eventually by over 20% of the data scientists actually doing work. So it's a lot of money being spent uh, on just preparing data. One thing you're going to see with graph databases is that you store in data as you naturally use it and as you naturally think about it. And another thing that he always tells me is that the majority of companies actually store half the data. They only store the entities. They don't store the relationships. They try to figure out the relationships after the fact, which is actually quite interesting uh, if you think about it. So one thing that we're seeing uh, with the Amazons of the world is that uh, there's a collapse in the IT stack that's happening, and that's actually happening quite fast. So if you look at four-tier models, so going from three-tier support models and networking into uh, two-tier support models, you see with AWS, obviously, that uh, the complexity of your applications, the layers in applications are, were meant to be dealt with for scalability purposes, are being removed. Uh, so now you're having more simple applications. And now what you're seeing is that uh, relational databases and, and all the layers on top of it, just manipulate data and store data, are quite disappearing with the use of graph databases. Hopefully it will happen soon, but obviously it will never go away, but we're seeing that movement uh, happening in the market. All right, so one th interesting thing is that we've been dealing with complexity of our business applications and business value delivered by adding to our technology stacks over the past 30 years, right? And every year something new comes in and basically adds on top of it. Uh, and now we've seen the reversal of where basically it's starting to collapse, uh, which is quite interesting, right? So new technology is actually collapsing versus adding to the stack. Um, on the data side of things, uh, obviously it's really hard to get rid of legacy systems, right? You have main phrases have been around for 30 years, they're operating, they just work. You have data sets that people are storing, they love. Uh, they don't want to get rid of them because it's a drop security or whatever that reason is. So we're seeing that the data sets are staying there, but people are building out wrappers around it to start making use of graph databases and building apps on top of graph databases. So that's one, one side of, school of, of, of thought, right? And uh, the reality is what we see in the market is what we see in the left hand, on the right-hand side or left-hand side is that data is being stored or managed around applications versus building applications around data, right? So you have... Uh, uh, enterprise service bus, they're moving data around, they're transforming it for the purpose of that app versus storing the way you think about it, the way you're going to use it, simplifying um, the data layers in data, data storage. So if you, the reality is this is a people problem, it's not a technology problem. Uh, it's really hard to tell somebody that owns your data lake or owns um, some business layer or data layer that, or some data preparation that you're going to get rid of it because you're going to simplify your data. Right? They don't want to share this as job security. Uh, but if you break through it, the reality is you should not be having as many relational databases and linking data sets, uh, which is quite expensive. Right? Then you have people that swear by enterprise service bus, so move data around all the time, and it will get eventually to the place where it needs to be. And then you have people that swear by uh, APIs right, and, and their applications. But if you could get to what we have on the left-hand side here, 
right hand side, sorry, um, actually it's, uh, becomes a lot more simple. But again, this is a people problem, it's organization, you restructure an organization, how you function. So if you're dealing with an enterprise that has 10, 20,000 developers or technologists, it's really hard to get away from that. That's how budgets are allocated and people are, uh, bonuses are paid out, so it's hard. So some uh, things we've seen in a, over the past year. So think about uh, when you go to a drugstore, that label you get on your uh, prescription, it's actually quite complicated. Uh, it requires data from the drug manufacturers, like data comes from researchers, government organizations, and every government treats drugs differently and calls them different names. So it's really, really hard to put those labels together. Um, what we've seen is, uh, <laughs> this is another thing, another quote from Alan is that, it doesn't matter how complex or how big the organization is, you only have about a hundred or a couple hundred entities. The rest is just permutations or uh, they call uh, something, very, uh, something the same data set, uh, something different, right? Why? Because you're copying data from place to place. You have no way of storing the way you think about it. It becomes a lot easier. So for, in this example, actually, uh, because they're storing data in relational databases and how they managed and put these labels together, you have 10 layers of pharmacists actually doing QA on the data to make sure that eventually it comes together in a way that makes sense in your labels. So I'll skip this one. Um, so there's another use case is airlines. So think about airlines. Um, you might have 1,000 uh, planes in a big airline, or maybe 2,000 planes in an airline. You might have uh, 50 airports that you're serving. Uh, every airplane has parts and has maybe, I know, a couple thousand of uh, employees, right? But any thing, single thing that you actually touch or modify or affect and that mesh of people and things uh, has a dominant effect, right? Really, really hard to figure out with databases. And it needs to be highly available. Make sure that uh, things don't fail. Make sure that things are reporting back. Make sure that planes keep flying, right? Uh, so there's the systematic copy of data all over the place where we have race conditions because data needs to come in and gets modified and nobody knows what, uh, what affects, there's a storm happens in the airport, uh, what happens in three airports down the, uh, whatever, down the chain, uh, what happens to the people, how you move, move people around, uh, where do you bring the plane for service, uh, what parts is, uh, does that plane need, do you have the, the, the parts that you need in the airport you're gonna be at, right? Um, where is the plane due for scheduled maintenance or unforeseen maintenance. It's really complex. Graph databases can help simplify that significantly. Uh, think about the, the number or the amount of data they're actually replicating all over the place and the cost of managing the data, but also the cost of storage of that data and make sure that it's available, right? Uh, this is a cyber use case, uh, the major telco. Um, really interesting, uh, it's cyber, the default uh, tool set, ELK, uh, probably right knows it here. Um, when you have a threat happening uh, and you're monitoring your network, uh, at the end of the day, what people end up doing is, it doesn't matter the tools you have, people end up downloading a spreadsheet and just going add the spreadsheet. It doesn't matter how much money you spend on tools and fancy tools or whatever that is. And what we realize is that the reason for it is that people didn't understand your network topology and didn't have a clear understanding of the blast radius of an attack. So by putting the data in the graph database, it becomes really easy to visualize your network, look at your blast radius, look at vulnerabilities, uh, and where you should be actually hunting and looking and, and trying to address your, your issues. So one of the things that we realized as we're, uh, we're building this, uh, this product out for this telco is that it's, the visualization layer is actually really, really complex. It's really hard to get right. Um, the technology, underlying technology uh, with Neptune, it actually made it really, really easy. Uh, but visualization is really hard. And that, I'll pass it over to our colleague, Colleen. All right, thanks, Anton. Um, it's uh, really clear how advantageous it is to start with a data set that's been built from the outset with relationships in mind. Um, my name's Corinne Coder. I'm with Tom Sawyer Software. Um, man, there's a lot of you. <laughs> um, sorry. So, um, 
I'm Director of Product Development at Soft Tom Sawyer Software, and what I want to get you started with today is to get started visualizing your data in Neptune. So you really want to start uh, visualizing your data, building applications um, for your users of that data, and really just start to make sense of it. Um, so I managed the de development of a product that we just uh, launched on the AWS Marketplace, and that's Graph Database Browser. Um, which I'll be showing you today. Um, I also manage some of the systems, the uh, back office systems that we have, the front office public facing systems that we have that are all running on AWS infrastructure, of course. Um, I first came in contact with Tom Sawyer Software uh, when I was a developer uh, years ago writing SAN management software. So I'm, I don't know if you noticed my name, but it was kind of destiny. Um, I'm pretty sure I got my first programming job just based on my last name alone. <laughs> Um, so Tom Sawyer Software, um, we are experts of providing software for building graph and data visualization applications. Um, we have analysis algorithms built in. Our flagship product is called Perspectives. It's a platform for um, uh, development um, uh, using um, for, for data visualization. Uh, all of our other products are built on top of that. Um, we also have a full service team, solutions team, that can help you get applications built rapidly within days or a couple weeks to start visualizing your, your Neptune data. We're headquartered in Berkeley, California. We have offices all over the world. Um, and as I mentioned, we're now an AWS Marketplace seller, so expect more products. We just have one now, so search for it. Um, you'll find it. And we're also an APN partner, so proud to be here. And man, thanks, Brad, for having us. So we have many customers around the world. Um, these are some of the, the bigger names that you might recognize. Uh, we're in every industry from like biotech, aerospace. Um, we also have a model-based systems engineering product and business process product that we're getting started with. So like Toyota uses us, us for um, designing, modeling. Um, JPL is using us for Mission to Mars. It's pretty exciting stuff. Mm. So um, here's an example of building on what Anton talked about with the cyber threat analytics. Here's an example of a custom application that was built for a customer. You can start to see some graph data here, very small set, nothing really sophisticated here, um, but maybe something you can write with a JavaScript library that's out there. But I'm going to show you some really powerful uh, layouts in, in a moment with uh, some custom built applications. So how do you get started building graph applications? Well, once you pass that hurdle of putting your data into your, uh, your format to capture the relationships, and if you think about it, your relationships are already built into your data with you know, your foreign keys and, and things like that. Um, you just have to encode it to be in a, in a, in a graph model. Um, after you get it loaded, of course, the first thing you want to do is start visualizing it. Um, we have an application I'll show you in a minute that will make it really easy to start visualizing your data. The second, so you want to make sure it's right, hone it a little bit, and then start designing and building applications around it. Of course, deploy it to your users um, on a web app platform, deploy it into AWS, um, and start really um, helping users make use of that data. That's, that's what we're all here for. <laughs> so. All right, so deploying um, you know, into AWS. So just an example of you know, how we build our graph database browser uh, demo um, infrastructure and what services that we're using. Of course, when Neptune and Fargate came out, our solutions engineers couldn't wait to get a hold of this. So we're experimenting with Fargate um, you know, for, for scalability, uh, dynamic scalability. Uh, of course, we're using uh, Route 53, um, so, we, so really um, to focusing on the yellow bands, that's where our applications run and that's where all the, the power uh, that we've built in to, with the analysis and the layout engines are really running there. So Neptune's so scalable and fast, applications have to keep up and that's where we take advantage of this auto-scaling. Um, so how do you get connected, how do you get loaded? So. Um, if you haven't loaded your data into Neptune yet, um, of course, Neptune has the, the data loader uh, facility that you can use, or you can use our user interface that we've built um, to import your data from, from S3. So uh, Neptune works really well with S3, as you know or not know. So you just provide your cluster endpoint, and then voila, you are... Uh, you can visualize your data. Now, I'm going to show you um, a couple of different demo videos. Um, the first one is of our graph database browser. 
And the use case that we're modeling today is a uh, crime data set. So we have a crime network based on a real uh, bunch of criminals out of Seattle. So we're going to show, um, for, with Graph Database Browser, we don't have any knowledge of this data set. We're just going to point it to this, this data set in Neptune. Um, so start the video, we get kind of a, a default set of nodes. And what we can do with, since there's relationships to these data, is we can load the neighbors. So what we're going to do is load um, all the connections that these uh, pieces of data have to each other. And what we can do is run this between us analysis. So we can start to see in this network who the big players are, so who the influences are, who the, the biggest criminals are. Um, and you see that the Graph Database Browser will pull out that information visually for you so you can start to see. And these are the analytics that we've built on the back end um, using network centrality algorithms. They're all built in. Um, you don't have to rewrite them. don't have to reinvent the wheel. They're there. So we can start to select these incidents. Um, so drill in, get some more information, uh, look at their values. And what we did right here is run a clustering algorithm. So you'll see that they're now color coded to show which clusters they belong in. Now we have some different layouts so we can look at the data a little bit differently. Um, now we see that we ran this, uh, our circular layout, which clearly shows the clusters of data, and we can, we can you know, you're starting, starting to detect these patterns. So we can highlight, um, and you see how if you, if you search in the search bar without writing any queries, you can look, search through your data set right on the screen there, and you can start inspecting each piece of data. And we've done all this without writing a single Gremlin query. So um, important to note. So this is the phase, really, where you're exploring your data. You're, you're starting to see your starting relationships. So now we've written a query, and we, our, our fraud department says, can you investigate this guy, Rico Heath? So we've written a little Gremlin query. Um, now we've loaded the incidents he's involved with, and by loading the neighbors of those, so who he's connected to, and who, you know, who else is involved in the incidents that he's been involved in, we can widen the network that we're looking at. And again, running a, a betweenness analysis, we can see who the, the biggest players are visually. They just pop out, and, and maybe it's not Rico Heath. So we're, we'll look for Rico here. There's our guy, but maybe there's, there's somebody bigger, and we can immediately start seeing that visually. And here we can make sense. If we need to change the data model here, then you know, we change it. Um, so another thing that um, Graph Database Browser can do is if you, you, know, you don't want these circles and these, these colors, you can change, you know, put icons in there, different um, shapes, different colors, and um, um, you can change the appearance based on any property in your data um, so that you can, you can look at things the way you want to look at them and show them. Let's see, where are we here? I think we're just about the end. Okay, so now say we want to provide a complete set of, of the data to the fraud investigation department. So we're searching um, for all the fraud incidents, as you can see in the query window below, that we have all the fraud incidents uh, in the database. And this is a, this is a fairly small database, so I mean, you, you would have a, a, a lot more fraud incidents, which I'll show you next, uh, how you can really see a lot of data on the screen. And again, run clustering. So then at the very end, we can export this data um, into a list and send it off to the fraud, inv uh, fraud investigation department. So let's see. We can move on to the next demo. Ooh, I have my fancy clicker here. <laughs> All right, so that's an example of an application that you can actually look on the marketplace now, search for Tom Sawyer. Again, it's our only application now. Start playing with it. There's a free trial. Um, you can play with it for five days, I believe. Um, now, what I wanted to talk to you about next and show you is a uh, example of a custom-built application, purpose-built for, say, an investigation team where we actually know the schema. We know what we want to pull out of it. We know how we want to navigate it. So, so you all probably know your data, so you know, you're probably thinking about how can I apply these filters, how can I do this to solve my complex problem. Um, all right, so this is um, 
the um, complete set of fraud data so you can see how the uh, layout is, is the, the, the drawing is laying out a, a lot of information. Um, and what we'll do is search for fraud incidents. We're still on the, the fraud investigation. We're looking at the same data set. We're just looking at it in a different application now. Still a bit with perspectives. So we can search for fraud incidents. Um, uh, now you'll notice uh, you can um, use the filter on the left there. So we were looking at all incident types in the database, so now, now we'll just look for fraud incidents. So the filters are very powerful. That's something that's built into the web application uh, development toolkit. So we get many results and we want to start making some sense of it and there are some different views there that we can tap into. So what we did here is a custom algorithm that was written for this which shows um, the people who are connected to the most incidents. And so those are visually brought out. Um, we can easily start looking at that data and you, know, you can write your own custom algorithms as well to pull out what's you know, the, the important parts of your data. But you see how, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe you can start seeing how building this data with, with the relationships in mind can really, you can really help you analyze the data. All right, so we have a cluster of people here. And in the views, you'll see that, um, you know, you select one, it's all synchronized. You can see all the, the different, um, the data in context with um, the rest of the data in the view. So, so now we want to see where these incidents take place. So we go to our incidents map, which is a basically geographical view. We start to look for patterns there. Where are these things taking place geographically? And we can tell the fraud investigation team that this particular cluster, if you'll remember, we zoomed into a particular cluster. So this particular set of people um, is operating in this particular area of Seattle. So now we're going to the people network. This is another custom view because we understand you know, what we want to show and we start seeing how the people are connected not only to incidents or not to incidents at all but to each other. We start to see that. We have some animations behind it. They might be annoying. We might turn them off. <laughs> they might be cool. Um, so we also have a timeline view down at the bottom. Um, if you notice, you can actually hone in the time window that you want to look at your data. All right. So you can start to see like who the big players are. You can start to know who to report uh, back to your fraud investigation department. And let's see, do we show the bar chart in a minute? Um, so yeah, as you can see, the, the animation, the uh, analysis algorithms, the layout algorithms can really help your mind kind of wrap your head around some of these complex problems. So yeah, I just wanted to show, last thing is this uh, bar chart where um, you can, you know, a typical bar chart where you can just hover over and see how many of, of each you have. And again, all without writing queries, you know, so the table views, all right, and at the very end, yes, you can export your data. All right, and I think that's all I wanted to show here. So let's see, and that's it. So, all right, thank you so much for having us, and we'll turn it back over to Brad for questions and answers. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining. Um, if we, ha we do have some time, so if you guys have any questions, we'd be happy to take a few here. We also be happy to stay around uh, after the session to talk to people individually as well. So there's one in the front. So the question was, the process of getting data from S3 into Neptune, how did you map the relationships? And so it, you, when Anton was talking, he, you know, he mentioned that we all have entities in our data, but the relationships themselves are not always captured. And so, in general, what people do is that they're typically coming from some source system, and they'll go through and build either a model of nodes and node properties and then edges and edge properties out of the characteristics of the source data, um, or 
they'll then use sort of transactional, they'll do it in an object model way where they'll create objects and then store them directly into the, the data model. So in general, it's like an ETL process where you take a look at the source data that you're coming from, you decide of the tables in the source data, which ones represent entities, which things represent relationships, and then you put those into, for property graph, uh, CSV-based serialization, or for RDF graphs, Neptune supports four different RDF serializations. Oh, sorry, in the middle there. So how do you decide when to basically add to an existing graph or to build out a new graph structure, for example? So for example, like, let's say you had uh, a fraud detection database, and then you had a biomedical uh, database of the fraud detection practice. Right. Yeah, so the question was, how do you decide uh, when to add to an existing graph or how to, or to um, build a new graph? And the example was, suppose I have a fraud application and a fraud graph, and then I also have a, you know, some sort of biomedical use case. I can see that there may be some connections there. You know, when, how should I make that decision? And the way that I usually think about it in general, and if you guys have any other opinions, feel free, um, is to you know, really make it very question focused. So are, do you have to answer questions in your graph that would require both sets of information? And if so, you may want to bring them together. And if not, you probably want to keep them separate. I mean, I think one, one thing that I have seen as an anti-pattern in using graphs is it's very easy, relationships are very powerful, and it's very easy to say, oh, well, this is related to that and this is related to that, and all of a sudden you've tried to model the whole world, and that, I think, is, a, is, is not the recipe for a successful outcome. So it's really keeping it really focused on what are the questions that you want to answer there. So. Are there other questions? Oh, over here, yeah. Yeah, so the question was, we, just, we talked about a lot of scenarios where you might want to use a graph database, uh, but what are the places where you, at, you, where you wouldn't want to use a graph database? And in general, it's really about the relationships. If your application isn't traversing relationships, you know, if you are you know, fetching key values, then a graph database could do the job, but it's not going to give you the best performance. It's not going to give you the other characteristic that, that you want. You might want to look at something like DynamoDB for example. Um, you know, if you have highly structured data that's, you know, built for a particular application, a relational database may be, you know, the best fit. So it's not, graph is not the best fit for all applications, but it's really about identifying that the key thing in the application is traversing relationships. Maybe it's person relationships, maybe it's transactional relationships between financial transactions and accounts and individuals. But if, it's, it's, if it has that relationship aspect, that's really when, when the graph, uh, it makes a lot of sense. And we had another question. Uh, direct and not on property graphs arrange information differently than uh, RDF. Are there considerations that have to be uh, in Neptune when, depending on how to arrange your graph information? So the question was uh, property graphs and RDF arrange data differently? And are there considerations in Neptune uh, to handle that? We are, uh, I'm also doing a deep dive session tomorrow. We'll talk about this in a little bit more detail. But um, in general, there's really, there are some differences, of course, between property graph and RDF, um, primarily around how you represent edge properties and how reification is then used you know, on the RDF side. From an application perspective, there's very few limitations about which one is right for which application, and it really comes down to really developer preference and a, and a few other factors. So um, from Neptune's side, one of the sort of product um, hypotheses that we wanted to have was to be able to give you the choice as to see which one makes the most sense. So we don't really impose a, you know, a particular um, structure on you to do it. Each Neptune instance allows both property graph and RDF. 
Um, you can choose to use reification RDF if you want to represent edge properties uh, on the RDF model, and then we, of course, support the edge properties on the property graph model out of the box. So, uh, okay, in the middle here. Yeah, so there are a number of different patterns to expose the graph database to the application. So um, Neptune itself uh, supports a Gremlin WebSocket server, as well as a REST endpoint that implements the Sparkle Protocol 1.1. Uh, the examples uh, that Corrine showed are actually with having the Tom Sawyer software connect to the Gremlin WebSocket server. Some applications have connect directly to those uh, endpoints. Other times, people want to make their, their data available in the graph in different ways. So we also have scenarios where people have used things like API Gateway to allow lambdas to access their graph, and they really expose, use lambdas as sort of an API mechanism to expose the graph applications out. So that's another pattern that we see. Uh, we also have some uh, sample code, some GitHub repositories that show you how you can use AppSync in GraphQL. If you want to give people sort of a GraphQL interface to access their data but have it backed underneath by a graph database uh, to be able to do the traversals necessary, and then those encode either the Gremlin or the RDF Sparkle queries that are associated with it. So there's a, a number of different, uh, you know, different uh, models there. I think, you know, in general, one of the things that, you know, if you've worked with graph databases, it's quite easy to inadvertently write a query that brings back the entire graph. And so, in, you know, when people really build the applications to put them in production, they tend to want to build APIs and layers around the graph aspects so they can really control and understand, you know, how the graph is being accessed. Oh, okay. Yeah, so uh, the question was, have you seen an application where both uh, relational databases and graph databases are used? And, and yes, absolutely. Um, they range from I, I've fraud use cases where you have relational databases that do transactions. You have your, your sort of data warehouse that does certain kinds of fraud um, OLAP queries. And then you also want to bring in relationship pieces. And so you can add uh, graph to that. Um, we also see cases where people started with a relational application, and then they, for example, wanted to add a new feature. So they wanted to add, you know, a social feature or some sort of shared interest piece. And so to do that, they take the relational database as the source of parts of their transactional data, and then they'll use a graph database on the side for to implement the traversal-oriented portion of it. Question in the front. So the question was, how can Neptune help you control access to users who have privilege to um, access the graph or not? And so Neptune uh, allows you the option to choose to enable IAM-based authentication for access to the endpoints that it provides. Uh, so that would be the Gremlin WebSocket server or the, the REST endpoint. Today, Neptune itself doesn't provide more fine-grained access control than that, so the IAM authentication allows you to either access the graph or not. So today, if you had more fine-grained access permissions that you need inside of the graph, then that would be something that you would build into your application. I would, as a side comment, a fairly common use case that we see is using graphs in a graph database to manage very complex entitlement relationships and authorization relationships themselves. So not necessarily having the, the permission in the database, but using the graph to model uh, what organizations or groups or subgroups can see particular things. Are there other questions? If there's any in the back, jump up, because it's a little bright, so I can't see any hands. So. <laughs> in the front here. Yeah, so the question is, um, do we plan to support Cypher as a query language uh, for Neptune? Um, today, we support Apache Tinkerbop Gremlin, and we support RDF and Sparkle. We are very interested in providing a declarative graph query over property graph. Um, we don't today plan to support Cypher specifically, 
There are a number of activities going on in the community in general to look at different options for declarative query over property graph, the GraphQL pieces, or GQL rather, not GraphQL. And so it's something that we're continuing to watch and we're really interested in use cases for it. So if you have something particular, be happy to follow up and talk about it. Are there other questions? Oh, there is. <clears throat> Yeah, suppose, <coughs> excuse me, suppose that um, you had many, many different IoT devices and you were operating them on behalf of your customers and you wanted to be able to specify which of your customers and which parts of those organizations could see data from which of the devices. And so, you know, one way to do that would be to model the organizational hierarchies in the graph, to model the device and the data type hierarchies in the graph, and then you can use relationship queries as you're evaluating access decisions to help understand whether a particular user can access them based on some particular organizational attributes they have, and then for those, what are the particular sources of data, or you can do it at a model level, for example, what are the elements in the model that you would want to access? Other questions? All right, well, thank you very much. Um, appreciate it, and uh, have a great re-invite.